Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Emergency Response and Private Wells Colloquium. I am so grateful to have you here today. I think this is going to be a really interesting, really fascinating event. Um, this is the first of two parts. We will be here same time, same place again on Thursday, and I hope you'll be able to join us for that second session as well. So to kick things off here, I just want to underscore why we developed this event and why we think this is valuable use of your time and why it's needed to really have this particular conversation. So we know that there is an increasing frequency and severity of severe natural disaster events that include hurricanes, but of course are not also limited to uh, non-hurricane flooding, wildfires, tornadoes, earthquakes. We know that these events are happening and the response is increasing in need. But this coupled with the unregulated domestic well arena and knowing that these wells are underserved and often harder to reach makes it even more important that we talk about these two issues together. Because we know that not all of these wells look like a well-kept uh, private well with um, a nice bucket there. They often look like um, unfilled <laughs> wells in a backyard that may be a risk, or wells that are more like this that are hand-dug wells that are very old and are at great risk of contamination. So together, a couple, we know that these are a great issue, and I think these presentations today are going to be really, really interesting. To kick things off, I want to share also who we have here. My name is Jennifer Wilson. I uh, manage the communications for our private well program at the University of Illinois. I have Katie Buckley here as well. She is running the Q&A session. And then we have Steve Wilson, who many of you know as our program manager. Steve, unfortunately, is under the weather and will not be on live, but he is here helping us manage the questions in the background as well. Our funding comes from RCAP uh, through the US EPA. We are entirely grant funded, so everything we do is a free service to the public and to professionals like you. I want to just take one slide to share a little bit about what we do. It's not the focus of today's presentation at all, but I know that we have so many folks here who may not be fully familiar with what we do um, at the U of I. We're based at the Illinois State Water Survey, and we run the private well class. And so what the private well class is is a free online class designed for well owners, but we know many professionals like yourselves enjoy that as well because you may not have the depth of knowledge you would love to have. So it's completely free and self-paced. You can go to privatewellclass.org and enroll to sign up. Or if you are an environmental health professional, there's a version of our class, exact same content, on NEHA's website where you can take it to get CE credit from them. We also do a free monthly newsletter. It's called our Partner Newsletter. This is where we communicate just with other professionals in the field that serve private well owners to make sure that you have the latest information both from our program and from others around the country. We share free resources, upcoming webinars, uh, and tips on how to do your job a little bit better. One of the things we're most excited about is our second private well conference. This is coming up at the end of May, and if you're not registered yet, we would love to have you there. We'll be in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania this time, and we've got a great agenda full of talks related to treatment, septic systems, and all of the hot issues that we know you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. You can go to privatewellclass.org conference about that one. And at that conference, we'll be talking about our new Well Assess app. This is a risk assessment app designed for professionals to serve well, private well owners and conduct comprehensive risk assessments of the well character, integrity, and vulnerability to contamination. And you can get links to downloading those apps for both uh, Apple and Android tablets at privatewellclass.org slash app. And we'll be doing a ton of training and a bunch of release-related things related to this app coming in the near future, but I wanted to give you all that sneak peek if you had not yet seen that. We're super excited about that. All right, jumping in to today's session. First thing I want to do is a couple more housekeeping things. If you do have a question, pop that into the question box, and we will be organizing questions um, for two different question sessions. We'll have a short period of time at the end of every presenter to ask maybe two to three questions, 
And we'll also have a longer panel discussion at the end. Our, our scheduled time today is two hours, and we have 35 minutes at the end for a larger panel discussion. But when you do submit a question, we would love if you would direct it to a specific speaker or the panel as a whole. So we know how to organize those questions and who you'd most like a response from. And also, if you would like continuing education credit um, or just a certificate for this particular event, um, two hours per day or four hours total have been pre-approved for NEHA and Illinois LEHP credit. Um, if your certifying body is a different state, you may need to request that separately. Um, but you can send an email to info at privatewellclass.org to request your certificate. If you do need that NEHA form, because that's what your credential is through, you can find that in the handout section of this of the webinar module, and you can also request that separately if you need to as well if you forget to download it. Uh, you can also find a copy of the agenda there, which which commonly is needed when you are submitting for credit. All right, before we get to the presentations, we're going to do a couple polls just to get to know you all a little bit better. So this first poll is just talking about your affiliation. Who are you with? Let's wait a couple more seconds here. We got folks in every category. All right, so we're going to share those responses. We've got 51% local health departments, 31% state government agencies, and we know that runs the gamut from um, health department agencies, public labs, 3% uh, federal government, 7% academia. We know we have a lot of extension folks that fall into that category as well, and then 8% private sector. Okay, here is our next poll. Are you personally involved with assisting private well owners during or after an emergency? So we have a couple different options here. Yes, most definitely. No, but others in my organization currently do. No, but my organization would like to get involved and develop this capacity. Or no, and my organization doesn't really have a role in this, but you just want to develop some personal knowledge to be able to help others. I get to see all the results bouncing around in the background here, and so it's super interesting to see how this is changing. Give it a couple more seconds. All right. So we have 59% in that yes category, and I really want to emphasize for those of you to, to chime in, and not just to share questions during our panel discussion, but also to share your own anecdotes and um, alternative solutions to way challenges have been addressed, because we know that there's a lot of wealth of knowledge out there that can be shared, and we hope to really make this a, a really interesting dialogue. 24% um, no, but others in the organization do. 7%, this is one I was most interested in to see, um, that there's organizations that want to develop capacity to, to serve well owners um, during during and after an event. And then we have 11% no, and my organization does not really have a role. But that's why I want to thank you all for being here today. This is more about identifying where you live. So what type of emergency events are prevalent in your area? And this is a multi-select question, so you can select as many as um, are re relevant for you. So here's the results here. We have 17% hurricanes, 82% non-hurricane flooding, 38% wildfire, 17% earthquake, and 54% tornadoes. So obviously we have folks from all over the country here. Um, one of the things that's unique about what we do is that because we're primarily working online with the private well class, we're able to serve everyone across the country and hopefully get information to those of you who are working in specific areas that have specific issues, whether those are natural disaster issues or specific groundwater considerations that impact private well water quality. Okay, thanks for your patience with those polls. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better and hopefully um, get some familiarity with who all is listening. All right, so our day one presentations, we've got three today and then three more on Thursday. First up, we'll be hearing from Drew Golson from Texas A&M University Extension, and he'll be talking on capacity to support private well water owners after natural disaster. 
Then we'll be hearing from Kimberly Phillips from the city of Houston. Her title is Weathering the Storm. And I know both Drew and Kim have worked together in the past, and so I think there'll be some synergies between their presentations. And then we have Andrea Albertson from University of Florida Extension, and she'll be addressing the role of extension in emergency response, lessons learned from two very different storms. A couple of points that I want you to pay attention to is the role of partnerships and relationships. Um, both today and Thursday, you'll see that some of these presenters have worked together online and offline to learn from each other, and we hope to kind of expand that network of practitioners um, with this online event. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to Drew to get started. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for, ha for having me <clears throat> and, and be able to talk about uh, at least our experience with, with Hurricane Harvey and, and the flooding and, and re our response to that. I um, really appreciate that being able to talk about this and, and really to, to, to talk about and plug the, the Water Well Conference, the Private Well Conference is, I, I believe, at least the three today that we all worked together um, met and a lot of that collaboration began at that private well um, conference. And so it, it's really helpful to get to know people that are doing the same things and be able to respond um, in different areas that, that fit um, and have the different get, uh, holes and um, being able to work with each other and fill those gaps with that. So I, I really wanted to make sure that was known. Uh, again, my name is Drew Golson. I'm with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and I'm going to talk about the capacity to support private water well owners after a natural disaster. Just real quick on some background, when I'm going to refer to the Texas Well Owner Network. That's a the Texas Well Owner Network is a private water well education work, uh, program that does workshops and, and educational events around the state. That's through Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Um, as everyone knows, the private well water in Texas and most other states um, are not regulated. There's no requirement for testing, no requirement for, for treatment if there does come back with some issues on testing. And so what, what our goal is to, is to focus on the education components of that, doing education workshops and outreaches around the state, and then creating some uh, materials like fact sheets that you see here um, that answer some of the common questions that we see as we go around and doing these programs. So we were, um, the Texas Weller Network was established in 2011. We've had over 9,000 participants within our workshops. Uh, we've held over 200 events um, in about 166 different counties. And about three years ago, we started a newsletter subscribers. So the folks that participated in our workshops and that come across our, our website, we're able to sign up for a newsletter. And then we send out um, different, uh, on occasion, uh, newsletters so that we direct them into areas that we see um, that could help them as private water well owners to, met, to better maintain um, and remediate and, or treatment or water quality testing, any of those type of areas to reach out to the well owners. As you can see in the map here, that's where we've been um, throughout throughout um, since 2011 doing our workshops. And we covered a, a lot of the states. Um, we try to get in all the areas of the state, focusing on um, the areas where we see um, a lot of private water well owners off of public water supply systems. You can see the two different types of workshops that I mentioned. We have two main types, what we call our well-educated. It's either all-day, half-day workshop program where we come in, they can bring water samples to us. Um, they can uh, bring their water samples and we'll, we'll test it for them. And we go over eight chapter topics. So that covers hydrogeology 101, water well basics, water testing, water treatment, septic system maintenance. And then we talk about that treatment options and we go through the results with them um, within this workshop. The other one's a one hour education program. It's more or less a water sample clinic where they can drop off their water samples and come back the next day, get their results back, and we go through an interpretation. Basically, what do those? Here's your results. What and what do those results mean? I just want to go over that background of the establishment of our of through extension, and then our a relationship with the private water well owners um, prior to Hurricane Harvey. So, in, in August tw uh, 25th, 2018, we had Hurricane Harvey made landfall. 
uh, in Texas, and it really just sat on top of us and came back and dumped over a year's worth of rain. We had over 50 inches in areas um, where it just widespread flooding all along the Texas coast. Uh, 27 trillion gallons dumped ac across the, uh, the Texas coast, and where we saw lots and lots of damage with water just standing, uh, less wind damage, but a lot of flood damage where it just set um, in these neighborhoods and in these houses and over these wells for a prolonged period of time. And it's estimated about $125 billion in damage. Just real quick, I want to go over what it looks like for a private water well uh, when it is flooded. When we have standing water, you have the flood waters rising. It goes over the top of the, of the private well is an example of a, of a private water well here and goes over the top of that and if it's not sealed, the casing's not sealed, it can go down into the top of that private of, of that water well. If it's not completed properly or there's cracks or in the in the surface completion or the annual annular seal, it can make its way down um, beside the water well and inside the borehole. And depending on the geology that the well's constructed in, you may especially in your karst areas, you may have more of a surface water, groundwater interaction that allows that water to, to get down into the water well as, uh, and, and, ta and take into the water well um, within those flood waters. And if everything's still in perfect condition, your, your well's completely sealed off and everything's in good condition, you still may have neighboring wells that are open holes or cracked or not um, completed properly that still may get into, into your well. And even more problematic if the well system is damaged, you mentioned cracks, uh, no seal, You're, you have a failed septic system that suspends these um, effluent in, into the floodwaters and can make its way down into, in, into the water well, into the drinking water. So when Harvey hit Texas, um, we looked around with it as an extension and the Texas Well Owner Network program and trying to figure out what we could do and what we should be doing to help when we when we see the the floodwaters hit. Uh, as a well owner, as a homeowner during a flood event um, during this time, they were dealt and had to worry about a hundred different things. Um, just getting back into their home and then all the things that they were going to have to worry about. And a lot of the times we um, take for granted that they know that if their well's been flooded that they need to have it tested. So one thing we looked at that we really wanted to make sure that was known was making sure that they knew the dangers of flooded water wells. And so we sent out and created press releases through our extension network, sent it out through all our extension agents and through um, Houston Chronicle and all the other newspapers in the area that reached that out to just really just show, showcasing the fact that they need to get their wells, uh, the dangers in flooding, and the, the fact that they need to get their wells tested and looked at prior to drinking it. And so with our experience with these well owners and the, and the connection with the well owners of, that are part of our network, what we've seen is once they realize maybe they, they do need to take some action if their well's been flooded, they ask the question, is my water safe? But then if they get to that point on if my water's safe and they are able to need they, they know the need to, to get it tested their question is where where do I take it and how do I take it where do I take it and how far is that during all this other issues that they're experiencing and if they do take it and get it tested they get the results back and they don't know what that means the positive negative is that a good thing or a bad thing we've had that question over and over so what do those results mean Okay, now I know, to, I know what those results mean, and I know that it, it, it's bad, and how do I fix it? And so these are all the questions that um, we will first wanted to tackle that first one to let them know that um, the, the, the dangers in flooding of a water well, and then hopefully we could look at answering those questions going down further to walk them through that process and trying to analyze how we can do that and how we can reach out to them and how we can help them through that, through that process. So I mentioned as we looked at that and trying to figure out what we can do, how we can reach them, um, we started sending out press releases over and over into all the areas the best we could know and just really telling them the dangers and how to and, and to, that they needed to go get it testing. Our hope was to start allowing and reaching out them to help test their water wells for them. 
but as widespread as it was and not having those funding, that the funding mechanism to buy those testing kits and then packing the testing kits and the, and the personnel to be able to do those, that's where we, we were worried and we didn't know how we were going to respond to that. And also um, the testing part. So we can buy testing kits, equipment, and get it prepared, but also we didn't think we had the capacity to test that many samples, being more of an education outreach um, program. And that's when um, one of the connections to the, to the um, Private Water Well Conference and Kelsey with Virginia Tech um, reached out to us with a mentioning that she had a rapid grant from NSF and saying what and her question was what can we do to help and so when you look at what I felt like what we needed to respond with with this timeline the two in the yellow were the two that I did not have a good grasp on how we could handle that and so that was my first reaction is buying testing kits and helping us test because what we could be good at what we were good at is sending out press releases we could coordinate um, testing events and working with the well owners. We had the connection. We had the contact to the well owners. And then we could look at locations. We had extension offices uh, in, in every county. We could advertise and we could work out the logistics to make sure that they have the kits. And we had drop-off locations and we could get those sent off. But then send it off to somebody that could help us test and then disseminate results. We could walk through them uh, with the results and give those fact sheets so that they knew what to do. Now we got the results. What do we what can we do and, and how do we fix the problems? And so those are the two needed areas that helped with that collaboration. That I don't think any of this would have been done, or I know none of this would have been done without that collaboration. So as soon as we got that, we, we started getting to work. We set up in, in uh, neighborhoods, in areas where we felt that the biggest needs were. We looked through where the certain labs were able to do a lot, uh, certain local labs were able to do a lot themselves. And so we tried to stay more in more of the rural areas, where it was a long distance from a, um, from a lab, and working through those at county extension offices to get those samples to come in, packing those in those coolers. And then at, at the beginning of this, we're shipping them off overnight uh, to help with the, Virginia, with the Virginia Tech helping us process those samples. And so when we first set this up, we, we made sure there was just three or four of us within the network that we would made sure that one of us was there to receive these, sample, these samples, making sure they were packed properly, make, making sure they were taking their samples on the proper day, the day of collection, the day um, of drop off, and then making sure these were shipped off um, correctly. So one thing I think was really important for this response and being able to, to do the things that we did with this was the establishment that I mentioned of the Texas Well Owner Network. We have built up um, contacts through this. We've been doing workshops for several years. We've had contacts. We have emails. We, and in addition to that, we've had county extension offices in each county, but many of these have already worked with the Texas Well Owner Network, so they knew what we were about what taking in samples looked like, what, how important it was for the holding time, and all those things that the knowledge behind it, but also just being able to have someone local in each county was, was very big for us. And then so we, we could go there, and then with that next step that I mentioned with Virginia Tech and the rapid grant to help us not only fund the, the areas where I felt that I didn't know how to take the next step with, um, but also had that more of a research focus. So not my focus was just to, and the Texas Well Owner Network's focus was really just to how can we help them, how can we educate them, how can we help them get their wells tested, but that research mind of let's try to do some research during this because it's we, there's not much research available um, directly after a flood event, and how can we use this research to help um, prepare ourselves better for the next next time we have a flood. And so with those three things, I believe, working together in that collaborative effort, we um, immediately after Hurricane Harvey, we did 61 water well testing clinics or events, and we um, tested over 1,500 water well owners. So during the Hurricane Harbor response, just like I mentioned, we, we provided free testing for over 1,500 water wells. We delivered 61 water well testing events, serving 29 of the hurricane-impacted counties. And really what I felt like we were trying to do is communicate to private water well, or water well owners the best management um, practices, information, and then help them walk through 
what to do now. Now I got a positive, what can I do? Can, is there disinfection um, and how to properly do that well disinfection? I mentioned getting that outreach and making sure they get the results back to them. So during this process, we created the team uh, working with Virginia Tech and, and here at Texas A&M, we created several different um, materials that we used and will continue to use into the future. But here's an example of what their response or their, their results look like. So if, they're, if they had a positive, we don't want to give them a positive. We want to explain what a positive means and where it comes from and then some links is try to direct them as to much help and links that we can. So we worked through this process. We also developed a, 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 a water well disinfection um, trifold step-by-step -step protocol on how to disinfect their well. And that was a group effort, a, a large group effort that came together to try to look at what was out there, how many different methods are there, what's the best, me best method, and what's the best method we can get to folks um, to make it um, to make it work for their water well. We showed them a video that was great, um, that had already been done, um, and just general information, and then our contact information. We wanted to make sure that they didn't just get results and they, they didn't have anybody to ask questions about. So it was a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, mailed letters and responses from Virginia Tech, and then lots of phone calls again. And I'm still um, getting phone calls as folks are working through this. Um, I mentioned, so here's an example of the materials we developed. Here's the how to disinfect a private water well system that was developed during this time. We looked at the overall analysis um, of the water well testing. And so this is overall, and you can see the dates below, um, immediately after people started getting back into their homes. It's very important that um, we have this information from time zero that the moment that they got back to the house, they're able to get the results. And what did that look like from the time that they got back into their homes um, and the first started getting the testing and, and then going, going down the line, down the dates as we continued to do these rounds of clinics. And again, these clinics were done in areas we felt that were hard to reach, hard for them to reach a, 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 a private water well lab or a local water uh, testing lab. And so we were reaching out them and we could only, we had 29 counties and so we tried, we had some that were overlapping um, on these dates, but these were sporadic dates, maybe once a week. Uh, we'd come back once every other week to these counties as we went forward. But you can see uh, immediately after um, the flood, uh, the, the total coliform was up to over 46% and then almost 12% of positive for E. coli. And that's quite a bit higher uh, contamination levels than we see normally as we do our programs. And so there was an issue with flooded water wells and affecting their water, their water well. And as you and also want to point out, this is an overall, this is anybody that, can, that um, participated. We, we sent out um, press releases. So anybody that wanted to, um, to participate in a well clinic, maybe their well was flooded, maybe they weren't, maybe they used this as an opportunity to get their wells tested. That there was no, only the ones that were flooded um, that um, participated in this. But we did see high levels of up to 12% of E. coli. Um, immediately after. And then you can see that taper off and really back to what we would consider our normal responses or normal results from our programs is around 30% uh, total coliform and around 3% of positive for E. coli as you go down the timeline. To taking one example of a one county um, where we did multiple programs within that county, um, lots of flooding. Um, issues in Wharton County specifically and how that looked like over time. Um, immediately after the, the floods started um, affecting that county, we started doing clinics and that was up to 20. The first time we did that, we had 20% positive for E. coli, um, well above what we normally see. Big issues going on in that county with flooded water wells. And then as you can see that 15% for, uh, excuse me, 50% the next time, 10% um, after that, and then really back down to our normal normal ranges as it goes forward. And we're, we had a lot of repeat uh, customers or repeat well owners coming trying to fix the problem. And, and so as we, as we tell in through November, 
um, folks wanted to make sure and working with them on well disinfection, how to properly do that, as you can see the timeline going forward through that, uh, through that response that we had for Wharton County. Here's just a good map to show you the widespread um, effects of this. Normally our flood events are probably going to be one to two, three counties wide, if that, and so we can focus in on this area. And some of our results, we, we have several results, but they're so widespread on the counties and so widespread on those dates as we were going through there um, trying to set up clinics in these certain areas. And if you see that um, those two counties, that's um, Houston or Harris County and Brazoria County area um, there with, where we did no uh, much testing um, in that. And that it mainly is because of the two labs, um, and you'll be hearing from one um, after me with the Harris County or the, the city of Houston doing so much testing within their area and Brazoria as well. And we really focused our efforts on the outside of those, of those efforts, trying to reach those well owners that couldn't, couldn't drive into those areas. And I mentioned the research component um, that uh, Virginia Tech and the NSF Rapid Grant brought to the table was, was not only my focus was to out, get outreach and, and get the results to them and, get, and help them get tested and know that they needed to be tested, but what they brought to the table that I thought was just um, really valuable to the, to the research component was inserting a questionnaire. So we're able to get this information from them right after the Hurricane Harvey affected them, asking them questions about what they were doing. Was their well um, head submerged? Are you drinking your water? Was there damage? Um, if you didn't drink, how long did you not drink? Did you try to disinfect your well? Lots of information that still um, we're working through to try to get a lot of, lot of answers um, and correlate those to those results to see how we can react maybe differently or better next time Next time we see a, a flood. So some, we're going to go through some examples of these results, at least these preliminary results as they answered some of these questions. And I showed you this, these numbers earlier, about 47% total coliform, about 12% E. coli of those overall results, at least that initial, initial program um, immediately after the flooding, um, which is which is elevated. Those are elevated levels from what we normally see pre-flood. And so that, that is a big concern. But when we ask the question, was your well submerged, residents that reported that their wells were submerged versus not submerged is even more concerning as it's eight times more likely that their well has E. coli in it than if it's not been submerged. And you can see that not submerged is back to our our normal uh, pre-flood levels and how high um, issue, how high and, and positives that we see with issues with water contamination in our private water wells for the wells and the homeowners that say that their well have, has been submerged. Some other questions we looked at and uh, dive a little bit deeper into is drinking. Are they drinking their water, their private water well after the flood? And so uh, these are the results. 44% um, say that they're drinking without any treatment. 26% drinking with treatment, and 30% saying that they're not drinking. As you dive a little closer in and look at that 44% that are saying they're drinking their well with no treatment, these are their results. And their results are 48% of total coliform, and 13% of those are um, were positive for E. coli. And then we ask the question, how safe do you feel that your well, um, how safe is your drinking water from your water well um, after the flood? And we ask that question, and there's some interesting results from that. And so of those 44% that mentioned and told us that they were drinking their well without any treatment, this is how they feel um, their water, how safe their water, they feel that they're um, safe their water, uh, private water well drinking it, water well um, quality is. And so we, I think we have two stories with this, with 42% stating that they're drinking it without any treatment, 42% uh, feel that it was safe. So I think that plays into the important role that we mentioned at the beginning of, of letting them know the dangers of flooded water well, and that's, that's an important role on out, in outreach with private water wells, is letting them know the dangers with flooded water wells and what they need to do. And I think you look at the other side of that 
35% believe it's not safe to drink, but they're still drinking it. And so why are they doing that? Is it because those other questions I mentioned that I've seen, we don't know where to take it, we have the results, but we don't know what they mean, or we have the results, we know what they mean, but we don't know what to do, but they're, so they're continuing to drink it. And so what our efforts try to focus on is really answering those that not safe and, and safe and those what I perceive as the issues with those responses and where education plays a role um, trying to, to answer that the problem. Best ways to provide residents with information. Here's where we ask, how do you want to be reached? How do you want to get your information back to you? And it's very personal um, when you show how they want to be, re um, be responded to. They want direct responses to them. This could be a, really a two-tier response as you put out mass media to get their attention to let them know the dangers. But if they have their wells tested, they want direct results. Um, and they want, in, the, in my experience with that, they want lots of phone calls on working through what the results mean, what can we do now, and how can we fix those problems. Just some other questions from the survey um, as we go through there. I'm going to go through there pretty quickly. But was your water um, well system damaged during Hurricane Harvey? Um, 13, a little over 13 percent saying it was. And was your wellhead submerged um, under the flood during Hurricane Harvey? So these are the folks that participated with us, participated um, in, the, in the sampling clinics. And we had over 27% said that their well was completely submerged. Um, but we also have a lot of folks that have answered those two questions that I, I don't know. And if you, you know, imagine they are kicked out of their homes or they are asked to, uh, to, to go to higher ground for several weeks, a long period of time, and they don't know when they're coming back. And a lot of times, the time that they come back, that water has receded. And so they don't, they don't know what happened. Um, and so, they, again, the importance of letting them know um, how important it is to test their well. And we asked the question, was your well um, shock chlorinated? And we almost, a little over 70% of those said that they know. And, and they said, yes, um, uh, did it ourselves, and then some, and even less, hired someone to do it. And what we felt, uh, what I saw with talking to folks on the phone, phone was if they did want a uh, hired professional to come do a, a shot chlorinate through a well, they were on a long list of, uh, to a waiting list to get that done as they were, um, pro our, our drillers were just spread too thin on trying to answer all those phone calls to come and, and add a professional service to get that done. And so with my last slide, as we look forward um, to what would happen, what would I do for the, for the next one, what I feel like what we would need to have prepared in a checklist on getting ready for the next flood um, is, is really materials. We created a lot of materials and, and, and tried to do that pretty rapid um, amount of time. And we, we changed some as we went through there, but having those materials ready. And those materials will include press releases um, to alert them of the issues of, of flooded water wells, disinfection protocol, um, having that ready to send out to them, the, the proper protocol, and then those sample results. Here's your results and what do I do now? Having all those materials ready to send out and, and really sending out to other areas of the, of the country that may need those as well. Local labs, collaborating, are you complimenting um, local labs? During this time, I feel like we complimented. We tried to cover the areas that, that weren't covered by these local labs. But could there be a collaborative, more of a collaborative effort with these local labs in the future? And I think so with that. Um, talking to some of these local labs is they felt like they had the capacity to test, but they felt like they weren't reaching the areas that we could reach, but they did not have transportation, they didn't have funds or vehicles and folks to get that. And with an extension service, we have um, extension agents in each county that could, could develop a, um, a flood plan. What happens if, it, uh, uh, if we have flooding in my county? And we could set up um, maybe three to four days a week testing campaigns where they're delivering water samples to these labs instead of waiting for us to come to a clinic uh, once, a week, uh, once a week or every other week. And then funding, have that funding ready or at least a, a plan to where you can go about looking at that funding is that was the, the, 
the biggest barrier as I was looking forward of how I can respond was the lack of funding and really have a contact list for emergency personnel. Who's that emergency personnel? Um, having them ready so you can collaborate with the local efforts. Having those goals, my goal at the Texas Weller Network and Extension's goal was um, honestly to get outreach education and give them a way to get their wells tested. But having Virginia Tech come in with a little um, additional addition, additional goals with that is was just so much added value to where they were looking at. Let's put in this survey. Let's see. Let's change a little research goal and add that to your goal so that we can um, have better data so we can help folks it better in the future. And having a mentor group, um, the collaboration and efforts that I mentioned several times with this, having that group that has these preparedness checklists, has those materials, have those um, experiences that you can walk through and with through if, when you may be going through this um, flooding efforts. The well disinfection, we saw lots of problems with that. Um, they weren't doing it correctly. They didn't know a lot of information about their wells. So could we create videos, well disinfection demonstration uh, videos that they're able to walk through those videos on a um, basis, on a time basis, whenever they're ready, they get back into their house and they can go through those well disinfections to maybe have more effectiveness with those well disinfections. And really, one of the issues that we saw um, going through this process was results dissemination. Um, trying to get the results out to everybody. Um, when you have 1,500 um, results and that one person doesn't get the results, that's the biggest result uh, that they needed to see for them from their perspective. And so making sure none of them fall through the cracks and everyone's dealt with um, personally because that's what, how they, wanna, they, they want their, their information sent to them. Here's a, a list of the collaborative outreach um, sponsors through this um, as we went through the rapid grant and into FEMA helping us out um, towards the end and then um, the, the folks at Virginia Tech and LSU helping us with, with the surveys and the, really looking at the research component of that. I appreciate your time and uh, allow, I don't know if we have questions after this or, or at the end of the program. We do have some questions for you. Okay. Um, first one, I want to tag on to you were talking about having having the goals from your partnership with Virginia Tech was was really useful. Um, one of the questions we have here is, do you think the survey helps increase awareness? For example, possibly more well owners may think their water is unsafe in the future once you get them to think about it. Yes, I think it helps with awareness. I, I think it helps with our mentality of what um, their perception of it is. And so I think it helps us direct that. I mean, it was it was an afterthought, but it wasn't a big deal that when we felt like, okay, we just need to get the word out of, of the dangers of that. But as you go through with that survey and kind of see more of their perception of what a, of what their view of the, the water being safe or not is, and then why? Why are they not getting certain things tested? I think you're able to tackle those education issues and outreach issues better by, by going through that survey data. Yeah, and understanding maybe underlying some of their motivations or, or lack of motivations there. Uh, yeah. Um, a lot of the materials you talked about, are these available on your website or something you could share with this group? Yes, we have most of the, um, the, the at least the public, the well disinfection, that's all on our website, as you can see on the screen now. We have a, we created a tab after this called Flood Resources, and so it's available there. Um, all right, we have a couple questions here about testing. What type of testing kits did you buy for the well owners? We, well, what we started with, um, well, for the most part, we did uh, microbial um, IDEX, um, and we did uh, total coliform and um, E. coli. And we, um, throughout this, we did quantity tray, so we're able to, to quantify, enumer enumerate those results with this. Um, Virginia Tech, at the beginning of it, did some IPC data to kind of see what, what the floodwaters um, were doing um, and see the, if those were getting into water wells. But um, as we took this over after that, we um, just focused on IDEX. Um, and, and what we did, the results we gave them was presence, absence on um, through total coliform and E. coli. Um, were local labs compensated for the cost of the testing? What was that relationship? 
From what our perspective, um, the local labs, uh, the one I know of, maybe, um, and, but not from what our efforts and what we were doing, it was us doing the testing. So we were taking all our all our um, samples back to here at in, to Texas A&M and using our incubators um, towards the end of that. The beginning of that, we were overnighting them to Virginia Tech through their uh, NSF Rapid grant, and so. The effort specifically on our clinics, we were doing those those testing. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Drew. We have lots of questions coming in. Please, participants, continue to submit your questions. We're, this is going to be a great discussion at the end. But for now, we'll move on to our next presenter. Okay, first I want to say thanks for having me here. Um, this is a subject that is so close to my heart, and I've... I, literally worked my whole career um, for this um, for these people okay um, I could just say what Drew said is basically what I'm going to say but um, we're, we're from a little different perspective here um, and that's why I titled this weathering the storm we kind of um, go from start to finish here and we and it seems to never end. So let me tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a microbiologist with the Environmental Microbiology Department of the Houston Health Department Laboratory. I've been um, doing this for 31 years. Right before, right after college, I went to work for Halliburton Services and there I learned all about how uh, wells work, when that and that has proved invaluable to me while dealing with well owners. At least I can um, understand what's going on and try to help them just a little bit. Although the more information that they get from um, organizations like Drew's is just going to be so so wonderful for them. Okay, um, I've served on the standard methods committee for water since 2005. I've executed many lab projects in conjunction with TCEQ and served on peer review committees for them also for the surface water quality standards in the past. And I also helped train staff members from many labs around the state um, when our new methods came out. Um, our section is called environmental microbiology. We do um, potable water testing, which includes public systems, large and small, and private wells. We also do non-potable water, which um, includes monitoring lakes, streams, rivers, and bodies with the Clean Rivers Program. We do wastewater treatment plant effluents and raw sewage complaints that come in. It's um, constantly changing. We have lots and lots of samples. We um, also do milk and dairy. So, and food for summer lunch programs. So we have pretty varied sample set, but water is my main focus always. Here's a fact for you. There will always be another flood. No matter how bad one was, you can't sit back and say, well, we got through that one. There's going to be another one. In southeast Texas, there's going to be another flood. Here's some floods for you to think about and remember. Obviously, Hurricane Harvey was in August 2017. The official total was 47.4. Um, as Drew said, there was greater than 50 inches many places. I had 30 inches in my front yard. Um, Tropical Storm, Al Storm Allison in 2001 was 38.5. We had our tax day flood in April of 2016, which was 17.5 inches over two days. And way back in 1994, over about 18 hours, we had 28.9 inches. And I was there for all of them, and it has not gotten any better since. Remember, always run from the water and hide from the wind. Do not think the water is not going to get you, because it will. One of the things we work on constantly here is laboratory preparedness. Um, we stay stocked up always. We are always ready we, with sample bottles and Colert 18, which is from IDEX 
um, probably the same thing that uh, Drew uses over in his shop. Um, we also have arrangements made with our vendors for overnight shipments um, so that we can get more supplies immediately when we need them. We also keep our documents stocked up with sampling instructions, submission forms, well disinfection procedures. We have hard copies and online availability for those and also we have Spanish language um, copies of those ready also. As far as our staff is concerned, we try to cross train on our analysis as much as possible. During Harvey, we have volunteers from all over the rest of our laboratory that were helping us work. Um, we need to keep the staff educated on how events will unfold after a flood so that people aren't surprised about what's going on. We prepare scripts for notification of positive results and frequently asked questions so that we can have volunteers help with our phone calls, which are overwhelming at best. We update all vital information, especially our cell phone numbers, to make sure that we can stay in contact with each other so we can, if all possible, keep the lab staffed. And we try to secure tr translators for non-English speakers as much as we possibly can. Community preparedness. Over the years, we've learned from our mistakes, but it seems like we still have last minute confusion. And this is my biggest area of concern and one of the things that I work on the most and is creating a network of city, county, state agencies, of city officials, and community leaders. We create a contact list of cell numbers and share it. This is imperative. Communication here is is the key to everything. If possible, we need to meet and discuss the plans of action, including identifying sample bottle distribution and sample drop-off points, including directions and phone numbers, defining hours of operations, and setting courier delivery times that work for everyone, which is very, very important because it might be convenient for the courier to leave there at 5 o'clock and come over to the lab, but we'll all be gone by then. So we, this kind of cooperation is just imperative. And the public calls us for all this information. They expect us, they don't know the difference between the agencies usually. So they'll call me and want to know what's Harris County doing, what's Fort Bend County doing. They want all the information. So we need a clearinghouse with all the information for everyone to disseminate as, as easily as possible. As far as well on and preparedness, Drew actually covered all this really, really um, succinctly, but we this is what we encourage everyone to do, is to keep instructions, sample bottles, and forms on hand, to keep your bottled water available, to know how deep your well is, because that is absolutely critical to disinfection it successfully and to test your well regularly so you have some kind of baseline and know where you are um, before the flood hits you. Who's going to pay? This, unfortunately, has been such a huge issue for us during every single one of these events that I've been here for. Um, people just are in such um, a state of chaos the last thing they think about is that they're going to have to pay for this if, if um, someone's collecting samples for them, be it the county or their neighborhood um, agency, whoever, they're not thinking about this, okay? So this needs to be settled way ahead of time. If, if these agencies are going to want to deliver samples to the lab, they need to understand that the lab has to be paid. We we can't just do everybody's sample for free. Although we have in the past been reimbursed by FEMA after the fact, um, that hasn't worked for us lately. Okay, so everybody needs to be involved in this issue um, because we the last thing we want to do is turn away, which we never have done. But it could happen. So everyone needs to understand that these samples do have to be paid for somehow. 
what to do when it's on the way. We're hoping for more media coverage. This during Hurricane Harvey was the best that it's ever been. Um, when it's on the way, we're hoping to get more and more information out there. This has not been easy for us. Um, it's usually after something happens that they finally start talking about stuff. What we want is when Hurricane Harvey was three days out, we wanted this information to be getting out to people, okay? Because well owners need to know, do not use the water once your property gets flooded. Um, we err on the side of caution here. We don't say don't drink the water. We say don't use the water, okay? We have a big long list of things that we say don't use it for, but if we want to summarize it, we say consumption or contact. Don't use the water if you think there's a possibility that your well got flooded. And then we want them to broadcast the prearranged numbers for agencies, government offices, and labs that are ready to help. We want this information out there before panic ensues. After the flood, what happens once it stops raining? The fact is, the power's probably out. Hopefully the cell towers are still up. A lot, if not all, of roads are impassable. People are not tuning into TV or looking up web pages right now. That's, they don't have access. Lab staff, agencies, city and county officials can be affected too. So that phone list that you have, everybody's not going to answer. We, we need backup in every single area. And we need to understand that everything is basically at a standstill until the water starts to recede. People can't get to work. People can't get in their homes. And people certainly aren't thinking about sampling their water. Some anecdotal information for y'all, just to kind of give you a history here. Tropical Storm Allison was in June 2001. Our main lab, which is in the Texas Medical Center, was closed for eight to nine weeks because it was flooded. The satellite lab, which I happened to work at at the time, on the north side of town, handled all the water samples, which was over 10,000 samples. Whole neighborhoods on private wells inside the city limits were flooded. Okay, there's a lot. Everybody inside the city limits is not on city water. We tend to think that private well owners are just rural, but they're not. There's so many inside the city limits of Houston. One section had, that had never flooded had five feet of water in their houses. Most of these residents were elderly. Some had lived in those homes for over 50 years. Every sample that we got from that neighborhood was positive and most of them were positive for E. coli. Not everyone would disinfect, so wells got recontaminated constantly, exactly like the diagram that Drew was showing you about the communication between close wells. Most of them eventually gave up, but they just stayed in their house. There was nothing else they could do. So it was heartbreaking. Um, we have many customers with resulting health issues from this, including eye, ears, skin infections, as well as gastrointestinal issues. At least one family was in the hospital for chlorine poisoning. This is a huge danger. People chlorinate and chlorinate and chlorinate over and over and over, and eventually they can't smell that chlorine anymore. We always tell them, don't take a sample, don't use water, anything until you can't smell the chlorine any longer. They can't smell it. They're taking showers bath, drinking it, cooking with it, and like I said, one family ended up in the hospital with this. Hurricane Harvey, this is um, still so much in the news, and I didn't um, want to give y'all a bunch of pictures. If y'all need more pictures of these things, you can always Google them. We don't, I don't want to see them anymore. But this is what happened. The freeways and surface roads were impassable. Staff, including myself, we could not make it into work. The lab was closed for three business days. The first three weeks, we tested over 2,000 samples. 
Now, remember that we don't just test private water wells. We also test public. So our percentages will be a little different. 20 to, 25 to 30 of, uh, percent of our samples were positive for coliforms. Out of those positive, 60 to 70 percent were positive for E. coli. Many wells that were treated numerous times to no avail, which is very common. I, I talk to customers over and over and over. And every time I tell them your sample was positive, they're like, how? How can it still be positive? And we have no answers for them. OK, it's heartbreaking. Every home in one small town in close to Houston is on a well. Every property was flooded, some with three feet of water inside their homes, including some of the county officials. They have no access to public water. There's not a system that they could hook up to if they wanted to. So these are the kind of situations that, we, that we're presented with day after day after day. Every part of the greater Houston area was affected, which is not usual. Usually when there's a flood, it's like the north side, the south side, or something, but this was all of us. And we are still recovering. Here's a picture for you. This is one day's positive samples after Hurricane Harvey. We use the IDEX coliform method, which when there's um, coliforms in the water, it will turn yellow. We put this yellow bottle under a fluorescent light, and if it fluoresces, it's positive for E. coli. This was one day. These were at code 20. So that's 80 positive samples on that day. Here's another day. Every bottle represents a system or a well. These are all separate. Every one of them requires a phone call to the, to the owner to explain to him his sample's positive, explain what he um, needs to do. As you can see, this was just one day. It's an overwhelming task, and it continues to be every day. We continue to hear from people that were flooded, and there's people that are still not in their homes. It's just simply overwhelming. Some of the lessons that I've learned and we're still learning is that another disaster is always coming. We can never be prepared enough one th these are things we learned so much more during Harvey than any other time. Everyone is in shock during, after, during and after a catastrophe like this. It has never been so evident as during Hurricane Harvey. We, being the professionals, have to document, document and share what worked and what didn't. There cannot be a limit to our patience and energy for helping those affected. It just doesn't stop. We can't just say that's enough. We can't do anymore. We will be overwhelmed with emotion, exhaustion, and anger at the situation. And we were, believe me. The limits to how much we can help from our position is one of the hardest things that we deal with. We, we finally learned we have to take a breath, take a break, and just help one more person because there's always someone else that needs our help. And this is just never going to change. And this is why I'm so excited to be now involved with this um, group, because in the past, we've just felt on our own. So hopefully, every single time this happens, we will do a better job. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. I really appreciated how you touched on the very real personal and emotional impact that this work has on people, and that's not something that we can forget about in these conversations. It's not just about tactics and strategies to do our work more effectively, but we all need to be taking care of each other as well to make sure that we can continue to do this work. Um, we, we do, do have a way that we had, we had to speak to these people every day. Sometimes I would make 50 phone calls in one day with bad news. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard. I, I can only imagine. We do have a number of questions here, and uh, Katie's going to pop those into the chat box for you as well, but I will read those. Oh, she has already done that, but I'll also read them out loud to you. Um, 
Okay. How did you provide outreach to the well owners and your network if communication was difficult? Well, in terms of like the immediate hard. aftermath when <laughs> you know channels are blocked and, and, and it's difficult to get people. And that, that's something. Um, one thing I didn't say is my entire PowerPoint was missing when I got to work on Monday, so I had to redo it. So I forgot a couple of things to put back in. Um, what happened is when people fill out their submission form, a lot of people will put their home phone number on it. They're not in their homes. And so the, so many times we had no way to contact them. And that was very, very stressful for us because we knew that they did not know that their water was bad. Eventually they might call, but it's hard. That's why one of, one of the points that we stress the most is put a number on there that we can reach you um, at any time. So hopefully a cell phone number and not a home phone number. That's, that's a great tip. But and it is hard. In addition to the many, the many uh, tips that you've shared in this presentation, um, another related question, if people can't get out of their homes and there's no power and they can't even get to bottled water, what do you recommend to those individuals in the situation? Do they disinfect with bleach, boil the water? What's the message that, that you give? Um, the official recommendation from the EPA is boiling the water if you have to use it for two or three minutes, a rolling boil. And we do recommend that if, if we have to. Um, since we, um, it's, it's very hard to make people understand, no, you cannot drink it, but you also can't wash your hands, wash any food you're going to eat raw, take a shower, brush your teeth. That's the same as drinking it, okay? So that's something that we stress. We, like I said before, we err on the side of caution there, but we're very insistent that they understand no consumption or contact unless you boil it. I would, I myself don't recommend treating um, small um, amounts of water with chlorine because I think it's too easy to overdo that. And I already, I already talked about the dangers of chlorine poisoning, so. Well, there's, yeah, there's certainly an art to risk communication and the precision of words that you choose, but also to make those not only precise but understandable to the public. Um, I imagine that's going to be an ongoing theme in these presentations as well. Um, right. Did you recommend any point of entry filters to combat recurring contamination after floods? No, we don't recommend any well treatment except the official TCEQ well disinfection. Um, filters can be dangerous, okay? So we, d we don't get into that at all. Um, home, home water treatment units, last I heard, are not regulated um, very closely, and uh, they, can cause as much, they can cause problems if you don't, um, if they're not perfectly maintained. So no, we don't, if people have a well that just after so many times cannot be, <clears throat> cannot be cleared up, we, the only thing that we would ask them is to speak to their well service um, company about an inline chlorinator if they needed, if they could not get it cleaned up. That's, not, that is always an option. Yes. Um, and I think this, the, this treatment conversation, if you had, folks do have more questions or feel differently, I mean, some of our other presenters, maybe we can continue this in the panel discussion. Um, we do have one more question for, for Kimberly. Okay. How did the state coordinate with the counties during and after the emergency? And just maybe from your perspective, how you perceive that. And I know this, this coordination question is going to be an ongoing one as well. Um. The state, being TCEQ, does not address private well at all. So as far as how they coordinated with the county, I'm with the city of Houston. So um, I don't know. I, ca I can't really speak on that because I'm not sure how the coordination between those two agencies um, worked out. Um, we did not have any direct. Um, contact with the state. I, I spoke to them on a couple of occasions about different things and they just had have no um, they have no mechanism for dealing with um, 
private well systems um, as far as like going out and helping people chlorinate or taking samples for them. That was all dispersed um, to the lower level governments, counties and cities and, and things. So they actually, the state does not. Yeah, and I think I think that's a really valid point, and that that that's the the parties within each state and their individual roles is going to vary so widely, and who who takes jurisdiction and leadership over helping private well owners and and, and making those coordinating efforts, and oftentimes it's more grassroots, the folks who are exactly. on this presentation and listening today who want to take that leadership and make sure that these these populations, whether they're urban like yours or rural, are being taken care of. Well, and, and the best thing that any of us can do for these private well owners is educate them, period. They're, they need to know. I mean, there's people that have no idea even where their well hut is. Correct. Okay, they've never chlorinated. They've never tested. They have no idea. Okay, so all we can do is get that information out there as, as much as we possibly can and make sure that they know about us. I remember during um, Hurricane Ike way back when, um, one of the smaller cities around, around Houston was on TV um, being interviewed and he said, well, we have no idea where to even get our water tested. And that just killed me because we have worked so hard to get our information out, but they had no idea about us. So um, I immediately got in touch with him and made sure he understood we were here for them. But um, getting the information out is absolutely the hardest thing. Well, and I think that the, your role as, as a laboratory professional, um, it emphasizes the importance of that because the number one question is, is my water safe? And you need a laboratory professional to tell you that answer. Right. All right, let's let's move on to our final presentation and then we will dig into to, to a lot more questions here. All right, transferring over to Andrea. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Andrea Alberton and I'm a regional water resources agent for University of Florida Extension. I work in about 16 counties in the Florida Panhandle. And my co-author on this, Yilin Zhuang, is a water resources agent in Central Florida and Marion County. And I'll be presenting on the role of extension in emergency response and lessons learned from two very different storms. So in contrast to Drew's program, in Texas, we do not have an established well owner network. We're in the process of developing one. So it'll be interesting, I think it'll be interesting to see how we're able to respond as compared to how an established program is able to respond such as, such as Drew's. Um, I'd like to recognize collaborators. All of the data that I'll be presenting regarding Hurricane Irma, I'll be contrasting Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Michael response. All of the data regarding Hurricane Irma um, was analyzed by Mark Edwards's lab at Virginia Tech. Um, Texas A&M Extension, Drew and Diane were really helpful in terms of giving us materials for emergency response. And of course, I'd like to recognize those at UFI this Extension that made everything possible, as well as the Extension agents in multiple counties, as well as collaborators in the Florida Health Department, Mary Garcia and Michael Berry. Okay, before we talk about hurricanes, just brief introduction to private wells in Florida. So about 2.5 million of our approximately 21 million residents, 12% of Floridians depend on private wells for home consumption. Um, as we all know, drinking water regulations don't apply to residential private wells, hence the importance of education. We have an excellent Department of Health and a well section. They provide information and water quality testing to well users. They do this in all of their 67 county offices, as well as through a really in-depth um, and excellent website. They also manage the well surveillance program where they identify and monitor areas where contaminated drinking water is suspected. They do this in collaboration with the Department of Environmental Protection. And since 2000, they've taken about 185,000 samples from 65,780 private wells. Okay, so jumping right into the 2017 hurricane season, which was disastrous, right? You can see here we had four major storms um, that hit 
the United States. And what Drew mentioned about the private well conference, really that's what led to all of the work that I've been able to, to show here. Basically, I had gone to the private well conference that summer, interested in possibly developing a well owner network in Florida, and I had established relationships with Virginia Tech and Texas A&M Extension. Um, so right after Hurricane Harvey hit and Irma was about to hit us in South Florida as a Category 4, I got a call from Kelsey Pieper at Virginia Tech asking if we wanted to um, work with them in order to provide any impacted well users or potentially impacted well users with free testing. So of course, I said yes. I didn't know how we were going to do it yet, but I said yes. And the purpose of this grant, this NSF research grant was really to answer two basic questions. It was, were private wells contaminated after Hurricane Irma? And two, what were resources did well users want during recovery? And the second part, comprised of a survey, um, I thought would, was especially beneficial for us as we are trying to develop our well owner network. So Virginia Tech, what they made available for us was 500 sampling kits for Florida. And we were going to provide free analysis for total coliform as well as E. coli, as well as a number of inorganic analytes that I've mentioned here. All the respondents that were going to receive these well kits were asked to fill out a survey, about a 34-question survey, um, an expanded version of what Drew showed you. And basically what we were asking them was, questions about well characteristics, well water testing and maintenance history, um, knowledge about their well and how to best provide information for them, as well as some demographic information. Okay, so we had Virginia Tech offering to do this, this survey sampling. How about extension? How about RN? How did we organize ourselves to get the message out? Well, Hurricane Irma made landfall in the Florida Keys on September 10th um, when it was recorded as the strongest Atlantic hurricane in history. So as with any major hurricane, after it hit, um, it actually affected most of peninsular Florida, and it completely missed the panhandle. So I was actually in the region where we were not affected at all by Hurricane Irma. Um, most places were without power, just like Kimberly mentioned. There was hardly any internet, was spotty at best. What were we trying to do in terms of extension? So U of Extension in Effective Areas was really looking for ways to assess, one, employee as well as extension office needs, and two, clientele, what did our counties, what did people in our counties need? Extension agents were helping them with just general disaster relief, getting supplies out, doing agricultural assessments, taking care of wellness, food safety. Everyone was busy and it was really, really hard to communicate. So we had to come up with a communication strategy. Our extension is organized into five different districts. As you can see here, Hurricane Irma affected all four um, of Northeast, Central, Southwest, Southeast, and it spared the Florida Panhandle. I work here in Leon County in the Panhandle. So basically, we were in a really good position to help coordinate efforts. What we were able to do was um, we had set up a group texting app, not only for Wells, but just in general. Extension agents in our district had set up this group me group texting app, and we made that available um, to anyone in any affected area if they were able to join to join. So that was a texting, a way to text. Um, I sent out the word about flooding um, relief help through other water resource agents. I'm one of five regional extension agents that work in water resources, and we have two county agents. So I also emailed, so group text as well as emails. And then we also set up county partnerships, again, just for general disaster relief. So what this meant was a county extension director in an unaffected county here in the Northwest District was given a buddy in a highly affected county, and that communication was one-on-one -on -one within with the county extension director here and the person in the affected county. So word was spread that way as well because, again, many people didn't have internet access. So who responded? We had six K-12 
counties, six extension agents and counties responded that they would like to participate in the, the water quality campaigns. Basically, it followed the path of Irma. Um, Irma came in through Naples and Lee, Florida after hitting the Florida Keys and moved its way up and exited through the Clay, Duval, Jacksonville area. Six extension agents there um, said, told me that they were interested in doing the sampling. Sorry, I shouldn't, I should be moving this around. One thing I did want to mention also was that FEMA had declared so our governor had declared an entire state of emergency for the state. So it was an entire, FEMA had declared it a disaster area. So there were many counties where health departments, if they had indicated that uh, providing free well sampling was a critical need, they were able to provide free well sampling to their residents. What we were able to do in these counties here was we were either able to fill in in counties that hadn't declared well sampling as a priority, or we were able to provide an additional location. The counties are big, so a second location where people could pick up free well kits. Basically what we did was extension agents advertised sampling through press releases. Those then got picked up by local news sources. Um, sample kits were picked up and dropped off on specific dates and locations, and then they were all shipped to Virginia Tech for analysis. And Overall, we had 179 well water samples um, that were tested and surveys. We had a good, good response rate, 178 surveys were filled out. What I'll do in the next few slides is just give you some results of what we found. So very similar to what uh, Drew was showing for Texas and what Kim also showed, um, if you look to the very far right of a total 154 um, samples taken, about 38% tested positive for total coliform, um, I mean, and 2% for E. coli. One thing I wanted to draw attention to, so basically on the x-axis you'll see uh, different counties where some samples were submitted from, even though uh, the sample testing drop-off in locations were in a particular county, people from neighboring counties dropped them off. But one I wanted to highlight was Putnam, where you see we had 61 samples that were submitted. That was our highest county. And that really reflects a partnership between the Department of Health and UF IFAS Extension, where we had kit pickup at both of those locations. And um, the two people, Health Department and Extension, worked together there to advertise. So that collaborative effort was fantastic. A few survey results, um, and this is what we're using really to develop our well owner network. So one, thankfully, when we asked would you participate in well water testing again, an overwhelming 132 responses, 77% said yes. The 13% you see of only if bacteria is found, that what they meant there was if bacteria was found this first time around, then they would participate a second time. How did you hear about this opportunity? Um, we see that those community family networks were the most important, right, as they tend to be. And then uh, the work of the PSAs, radio, TV, newspaper. What is the best way to provide you with information? This is pretty much a carbon copy of what Drew showed us. Um, again, very, very personal. Um, they want to be provided with information through email, through U.S. mail, through phone calls, text messages, and then you have your PSAs. I feel that they want to have a person that they can also talk, contact with any questions. And Yi Lin in Marion County also highlighted that uh, she has a lot of older residents in her counties that are just more, much more comfortable with more traditional forms of messages, you know, the phone calls, the U.S. mail, et cetera. So this is really important for future references of how to get that information out. Um, finally, the last one that I wanted to show uh, in regards to the survey was what, what comfort level do you have in terms of your well operation and maintenance? So what we asked them, a scale of one to five, we've collapsed it into three categories. Um, how comfortable are you managing your well? About 45% said that they, they were somewhat comfortable. They agreed with that statement. 21% or not, however. What about I know where to find information about my well? 49% said they didn't. I know Kimberly mentioned how important it is to know how deep your well is in terms of disinfection. 49% said they didn't even know where to find that information. 
I know where to find information about well water testing, split evenly, 38% uh, did, 35% did not. And I know where to find information about treatment. Again, pretty much an even split. And what this tells me really, take home message here for us is, there's definitely a need for a well owner education network. So what lessons did we learn after IRMA? I think for me, the regional network of extension and research partners was crucial. None of this would have happened without Virginia Tech and Texas A&M's help. Second, um, it's more a lesson learned for me to remember that while I was in the panhandle in an unaffected area asking people to set up sampling campaigns in their affected counties, they were busy meeting other needs and had other um, expertise. They weren't necessarily water agents, nor had they been trained in how to let people know about taking samples. So the information that we were giving them, um, I had to be very short and to the point, um, bullets, things by text. This is a lesson, I don't know what to do about it. It's just really hard to know what's going on and who is doing what. There are power outages, there's lack of phone and internet. Many agencies are working on disaster relief. It's just hard to know, and it's a confusing time. For us, it was really important to establish the relationship with our EDEN coordinator. Um, every university, I think, has one, or at least um, land-grant university has one, and just having our Florida Eden coordinator know what we were doing, what's going on, and having her let UF know was really critical, also for future disasters. And then the importance of well owner education classes. Yilin, my co-author after this, um, started a more formal well owner education program. She has since given five classes, 25 max students, it's always been maxed out, and she actually entered in a collaborative partnership with the Department of Health where residents that come can have their um, bacteria analyzed for free through the Marion County Health Department. And it speaks to what Drew was saying, that having that educated um, group of well owner networks just really makes those networks re uh, will make it easier for us in the future to reach out to well users. And finally, most, most important for us as we move forward and start looking for funds to do this is that um, there is definitely a need for a Florida well owner network. Okay, so that was Irma. Now I'm going to briefly touch on Michael, and uh, that was this hurricane season, 2018. And you'll see that we, had, we were able to offer very different things based on how the storm affected us. So basically, Hurricane Michael hit October 10th, 2018, and it hit the Florida Panhandle. So we missed it for Irma, but we were hit square in the face in terms of Michael. It was a massive storm, just really, really strong, came up very quickly. Category 4 was unusual in that it maintained its category status about 70 miles or more inland. It actually came in um, to Mexico Beach. I think you've all seen those images where there's looks like a war zone. It came in just um, two miles under a Category 5. So this one hit really close to home. I live in Tallahassee and I work in Quincy. And the research station where I worked was out of internet power, et cetera, for 10 days. And we were really in the outskirts of the storm. Rest of the counties hard hit here were just de devastated. And um, we're still in re disaster recovery mode. This is what it looked like inland. You've all seen the coastal pictures, but this is where most of our well users are inland. Basically just flattened pine plantations. Uh, the photo down here in the far right corner is 70 miles inland. It took, took down buildings. It was just, um, the strength was unbelievable. Um, farms affected in the northern parts of our counties and the lower right here is, is in our coastal areas. Many areas were out of power for three weeks plus, but um, different from Irma, there were really no effects due to flooding. There was much less flooding only in the areas where there was a storm surge around, along the coast. So how was the extension able to respond? So basically we were all put on disaster relief work. We were called in to provide disaster relief in affected counties. Several county offices were actually used as FEMA distribution centers. Agents in less affected counties, us in the outskirts, were sent in to provide help to those in heavily impacted areas. So my role in this one was not primarily 
in well user um, emergency relief, but it was really just in, in basic disaster relief. What were we able to provide to well owners post Michael? The needs were different. Flooding was not an issue in most areas. Greatest issue for well users was lack of power for an extended period of time. So they were unable to pump well water. It was a major problem. So a lot of our questions were, how do we hook up a generator? You know, how do we hook the well pump up to the generator? Um, what we were able to do as UF Extension was provide those public service announcements, those well water safety, the drinking water notices, printed fact sheets. Um, we answered questions. Really what I dealt with more was questions from extension agents that had questions from their, from their clientele. We also had set up a working relationship with the health department when we were on standby. Five of our offices were on call to be well sampling kit distribution centers if they were not able to do it out of their health departments. In the end, we didn't do this, but um, it was just good to be in communication with health and, and know that we were there if they needed us to help. So you can see I was not able to put a uh, rapid grant together. Um, I was just too close to it. I, was, I wasn't able to organize that with any universities that were interested in doing research. So what did we learn um, now from Michael and moving forward? So basically, just like Kim said, there will always be floods in Texas. We will have hurricanes in Florida. How can we best prepare? I think lessons for me from these two is that each storm is different. But with a regional or national network, we can really keep a diverse information, sort of PSAs ready, that can be adapted for each situation. Um, I also feel like that we need information and expertise in multiple locations. In this case, I was sort of in the middle of everything. Um, I would appreciate having, and as we are planning disaster relief in Florida, we plan on having um, agents trained in multiple areas to be able to at least send the information that one area might need. I think lack of power, internet access, keep in mind that that can be for weeks and weeks and weeks. Have the information ready to print print things out and they could be distributed at the FEMA centers, for example, where people are going to get information. And each county works differently and ag agents work in this context. So yes, they work for UFIFAS extension, but they also have county responsibilities. So as we're asking them to do things or to help us, I think it's important to keep that in mind. Maintaining close ties with the health department is crucial for us, makes it just a much stronger effort. And finally, just the importance of developing our own well-owner network, becoming a recognized source of information, being able to educate people, and uh, provide these education interventions before time hits. Finally, this is how we plan on moving forward. You know, we want to, we're in the process of developing the, the well owner network. Elin and I are basically the network right now, but we're trying to recruit more people. Our goal is to improve well stewardship through education. We're working on providing that information. And we always want to make sure to work in collaboration with the health department. Love to have a research lab associated with it, uh, as well as work closely with the Well Drillers Association. And with that, I thank you for your patience as my computer froze and um, welcome any questions. Thank you. Um, we have a great question for you and Drew might have something to chime in here. Could you tell us more about Eden and your awareness of whether or not every state extension program has that? Yeah, program? I know. When I, said, when I said that, I was like, oh, I wonder if ever you... I know that University of Florida has an Eden representative. Her name is Angie Lindsay, and it's one person, and she's assigned to this network. And I know she goes to regional and national meetings. I know they have one in Texas. Drew, do you know if every single state, or is it the no, land grant university? It, yeah, I know um, a little bit, and it's you know shame, and we got introduced to them during this, but I, I think it's the land grant. Every land grant has um, the Eden. All right, and it looks like they, they do have a website, and it, it is based at LSU. Um, and so we'll have Aubrey tomorrow to, um, from LSU, and I'm not sure if she's familiar, uh, affiliated with that program, but hopefully she can share a little bit more as well. Um, we have a ton of great questions coming in. Definitely continue submitting those. Um, the next one, this is actually a question that I had, and we talked about this a little bit before the presentation. Um, 
we tend to be, you know, scientists, health professionals here who may not have the same type of training as, as the first responders. But, but if you're out there helping well owners directly, what safety precautions do professionals need to take? when they're assisting well owners during and after an emergency. And I can think of all different types of crazy scenarios here. So I'm wondering what you have encountered. So is this one open to the whole panel? Because I think Drew is, yeah, because Drew is more one-on-one. -on -one. I actually haven't been in the field helping them. Like we, we collect the kits after the people have, have gotten those, um, but I haven't been involved with that. I do know that one thing that was really important, and I'll mention this, I'll let Drew and I'll let Kim speak to that one, but something that's tangential to that is that um, in this storm where what people really wanted to do was um, they, needed, they, needed, they needed generators, they needed their, they were maybe in a habitable house, but they just didn't have any running water, and they all wanted to know how to hook up the well pump to the generator. And I think there it was just crucial for us to say, hire an electrician, hire an electrician, hire an electrician. So I know <laughs> I know those types of things, it's just important to let people know that there are certain things they just should not be doing um, by themselves. Yeah, I'll really just second that. I'll, from my experience, I mean, there were safety issues as far as um, wells go. Um, it, it was really, you know, ours was so much different. Just we had so much water and so much flooding. And by the time that they were getting back into it, there were, you know, cracked pipes and, and some plumbing things. But, um, you know, we always would say we, we went over some safety as far as uh, one thing I would tell them preparing as a flood is coming is to um, trip the breaker, turn off your breaker to your well if you're leaving your home um, and so that you don't have those those power issues. But um, Andrea called me during that time of her experiencing more um, damage and electricity, lack of electricity issues than, than what we had, at least more prolonged. And, um, you know, we're trying to ask those questions to extension of how we, they can do that. And again, I mean, just through it, Andrea and I talking, I think it was better left that especially <laughs> if you're asking extension how to do it, you, you might not want to do it. And, and just really hiring a, um, a professional um, when it comes to electricity uh, and just really recommending them to, to wait for that process. All right. All right. We have another good question. Um, this individual says that they support our state medical operations center by developing preparedness exercises. Other than managing or supporting the distribution of potable water and sharing public health and medical care information, what private well issues do you envision being in the realm of state government? Kind of a big question here, I know. Yeah, yeah. that's really for that question for me. Um, it's really for the entire panel, whoever feels like they have an answer or an opinion. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you restate that? Um, I know it's long. <laughs> so, what private well issues do you envision being in the realm of state government beyond, you know, getting people immediate access to potable water, like bottled water, or distrib distribution of information? I, from my experience, and I'm not going to answer that directly the way it was asked, I don't like, you know, what, what's in the realm of state government to that, but my experience with the, we, when I didn't go into this, well, we had um, several um, weekly meetings with, uh, through FEMA uh, groups that were organized, and it was our state uh TCEQ, it was NRCS, it was, I mean, it was every state government and every federal government that had anything to do with this. And I think there was like 25 to 30 different agencies there at one point. And, and what I think the note of that is not really answering their direct question, or maybe it is, but what we went around in the circle and me kind of sitting, you know, joining in later in the game, the question and the concerns from them, state government and federal government is, 
there's this problem with private water wells being flooded and, and hurting their access to clean drinking water. There is no regulation, there's no oversight, there's no agency that can do anything for this group. So how do we go about it? And that's how it got put on to extension of, well, here's this program. This is the only way we can do that. Well, and I know that at, even on the public drinking water side, that it's been difficult for that sector to come to the table when it comes to emergency preparedness. So that's even exacerbated when we don't have federal and state regulations in place to give even more of an incentive to pay attention. There's exactly right about that, and that's what makes this whole thing so frustrating for us, is there's, there's no umbrella at all. Well, and obviously this question of what states and even down to, to local entities should be doing to provide more oversight and regulation, that will always be an ongoing discussion in the absence of any kind of, of, of federal regulations. Um, all right, so let's move on to a couple other questions here. I'm going to... So after you've had, each of you have had these experiences, and you each touched on this a little bit, but what did you or your organization do to better prepare for the future? And even what do you still want to do? Oh, I'll go first. This is Drew with Texas A&M. And what I want to do, just very, the direct second part of that question is what I want to do in the future is have a better plan in working with um, other labs like City of Houston and Kimberly with Kimberly and it's, it's, we had general, some vague conversations I mean it was a crazy time and, and it's hard to get uh, too much planning effort going on during it and so and we've been in communication with them since then of, of what there's there's areas that we can do and that we're and that we do well and um, that we can we can handle and there's areas that they do and they can do well and I think we can um, push those efforts together to to do that better um, you know we one thing that I felt like we lacked is a consistency um, offering if they if someone in this county this rural county and during after the disaster wanted to come and, and have their wells tested if they couldn't come on that Thursday they may have to wait another week or maybe two weeks, and that's during the work week, and that's several hours because of the, the holding time. It was that was our limiting factors is getting it tested. We had the the, the planning and the connection and the re outreach, but offering them um, numerous days, and so that to me is working with those labs that have that capability, but maybe they feel like they can't reach out to those counties. And so I think just working together to fix those problems. Anybody else have any perspectives on this question? Yeah, I do. I didn't know if Kimberly wanted to offer. Um, I, I can go ahead. This is Andrea. Um, I think in our case, it's I think for us it's really imperative to continue developing those extension resources and get the Florida Well Owner Network up and up and going. Um, one thing that really, the way Florida is shaped, um, one thing that, that really speaks to me and I've talked about with our emergency coordinator, our Eden coordinator, is realizing that these hurricanes move quickly and they can sort of change direction very quickly and that's what I was trying to say about not having one centralized place where everything is housed or one person that can then send out just the importance of having at least one or two people in each extension district that that can then feed material or feed help or be that coordinating person just like Kelsey was for us with the with the Virginia Tech Rapid Grant and Drew and Diane were for us when they were giving us all these templates. You can't be in the middle of the storm and pretend like you're going to be able to provide all the resources that you were hoping to provide. So, so for us, um, I think that's one thing that I want to that I want to work on 
you know. And then um, just the continued relationship with the health department. I think we're, we're forming a strong relationship and having the health department become more aware that we are a resource that can help them locally as well. And getting to know FEMA a little bit better and understanding how FEMA works and, and uh, in the future be able to have a somewhat of a relationship with them or just having them know that we are there and, and can help in terms of information distribution as well. So those are things that we're working on here. Kimberly, did you have anything to add to that? Yes. Um, Your business Kim. Um, I have to agree with um, everything that's been said so far as far as outreach. Um, it's obviously always been our weakest point. Um, I'm, I'm so excited about the future and working with Drew and his group because I think they're going to be our biggest assets as far as getting our information out. Um, I would like to see some kind of, of app for well owners that has all of this information um, like a clearinghouse that we could get out to people so that when um, they have no, they don't, they aren't sure what to do, they could just look real quick and find our number or find Drew's number or where they could drop off a sample or whatever. We could update um, when when the need arose. I mean, there's just got to be some way to get the information out there during the event. Um, hopefully before. But during the event, it's so it's so hard to communicate. So that that's what I'm always working towards is trying to find some way to have better communication. All right, and yeah, and each of you mentioned different types of communications that you found effective and and of course less effective because of those those barriers. Um, one question that we have is: Have any of you encountered? private well owners that were reluctant to sample for fear they might be asked to seal their well or drill a new one. And of course, this is an ongoing challenge with just getting private well owners to test in general. But do you see any changes in that behavior um, after an event? I didn't understand what you said, reluctant to sample and what? Yeah, uh, well owners that are reluctant to sample for fear they might be asked to seal their well or to drill a new well. Um, they're just fear that the oh, government's yeah. going to tell them to do something that they don't want to do. Yeah, people, I'm sorry, people always want to know who we're going to give that information to. Yeah. That, that's a that's a common question. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just last week I had that direct question as we were doing a program is what happens. And so the answer is, is yes. And um, it's hard because, you know, if they participate, then they're, then they're bringing a sample, so they're willing to do that. But you, you know, you can communicate and and pick up on some of that um, reluctancy, um, bringing in their sample. But I do think a natural disaster, especially your well being flooded, um, can cause or at least encourage that to happen. And I, you know, I'm biased, but I think that's where extension helps, and and that um, relationship that we have and that name brand that extension has, we don't get a lot of. Uh, fear of regulation when things are worked through extension. I just don't have a big um, amount of experience with with folks feeling like that when we do our extension education program. I wanted to add, this is Andrea, that um, in the conversations that I've been having these past two years with uh, the Florida Health Department at the state level, one of them, they're strong supporters of the Florida Well Owner Network precisely for what Drew just said, that they do have people that that don't necessarily want to hear it from state government and they would appreciate um, a university extension resource to be able to send them to um, in those cases. Um, we did have a follow-up question for Drew um, and that was uh, what water well database did you find online to reach out to private well owners in the aftermath of Harvey? Sorry, I was muted. Um, we did not have a uh, database to reach out to well owners. I mean, that's that's probably one of our biggest um, hurdles of, of reaching out to well owners is being able to directly contact them. I, I think a lot of that was our establishment um, 
and our contact list of the years of attending of those that attended our programs and and then really working through the county extension agents contact list through advertisement and um, through the, the press releases and advertisement and, and directing them to our website to then sign up for our contact list and then we several counties had groundwater conservation districts and so we accessed their contact list and so it's really not a database for well owners but just using different entities contact list including ours and then mass media through press releases great i think that's going to be a, certainly a challenge that everyone's going to face is is no one one list of here's all the well owners and how to contact them right now All right, we have a follow-up question, um, you know, partially directed at Kim related to the app, and it's how will well owners use an app if there's no cell service during an emergency? Um, I have a, an initial answer to that, and that many apps uh, actually download all of the information within it, particularly ones that are more uh, content-based to your phone and don't require um, having cell service to access that information. So it could include... Um, you know, places to go, phone numbers, if you can find a landline, things like that, that but you already have that on your phone. Um, right. I don't know if there's any relationship right. with like, you know, 911 and emergency cell service and getting access to apps like that. I don't know how that works, but. Right, but my, yeah, part of my point there is, is having all the information in one place. You need to, you need to talk to this county or that county or the city or, you know, without having to go to 15 different websites to try to find out what you find what you're looking for that's kind of my point there correct and then and the challenge with that is that this information is so local that you really need a lot of buy-in to be able to create something like that um, all over the country uh, it's a fascinating right. challenge for sure um, all right a couple more questions here we have just a few more minutes um, maybe we'll just, we'll just end here on what advice should other professionals, so our attendees here, be sharing with well owners before an event occurs? So what's the one piece of advice that you want these professionals to go out and start educating their homeowners on in terms of actions to take or information to collect? What, what's that one piece of thing that you want to share? Okay, I'll go first. Yeah, whoever wants to. <laughs> Um, the one thing that I, at the end of every conversation that I have with a well, well owner is test your well periodically. Take a time once a year, once a month, once every three months. Keep check on your system. And that, that's the last thing I always tell them. Once they get a good sample, they're, they're like, yay, we don't have tests anymore. The first thing I tell, I mean, the last thing I tell them in every conversation is to check it again and check it again and keep track of the last time you checked it. It was good last month, but it's bad this month. Something happened. So that well, that they can is, have a better understanding of what's going on. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's valuable for two reasons. One, they can have a baseline. If, if there is an event and the well is flooded, they can know what it was like before to compare that to. And also, it helps them know where to go and how to have their water tested. They have that experience. So it's not, it's right. releasing that additional intimidation of it. Exactly. It won't be the first time that they did it. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree. If we had to give one bit of information to them is test your well, because that drives all the other um, things that they can do, um, steps that they can do, or best management practices they can do, um, that drives all those others is based on the response to their test. Yeah, and on top of that, just knowing where to test, you know, test your well, and that includes, in order to test your well, you, you have to know where to go and where to go for resources. So I think that has a lot of things wrapped up into it. All right, any additional final thoughts here? All right, I want to thank all of our presenters, and I also want to remind everyone, we'll help go here to this last slide, 
to come back on Wednesday for our final three presentations. We have John Hamner from the Rural Community Assistance Corporation talking about groundwater well protection and recovery from wildland fires. This is not just a, a, a flooding problem, so I think that'll be really fascinating. We have Allison Schneider from the National Environmental Health Association talking about the impact of disaster events on private water systems. Allison's been trying to collect information from, from folks across the country and really understand some of these impacts. And then we also have Aubrey Gilliland from uh, Louisiana State University to kind of wrap things up for us and share opportunities to increase well user resilience after a natural disaster. So we'll be continuing on some of these same things in conversation, so prepare your questions as you are thinking and reflecting back on these presentations, and we will see you on Thursday. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>